Hey, and welcome to another episode of Guys Like Us Don't Die on Toilets, a lethal weapon retrospective. Um, I'm Jake from Geek Out Podcast, and today we're going to be discussing the first lethal weapon film. Um, basically, what I wanted to do with this podcast was uh, celebrate the four film series Lethal Weapon. And kind of the friendships I, it's, it's insane to say but I, the friendships i've made through the lethal weapon films uh, you know they've been around since since 1987 and just how much i've enjoyed the movies anytime they're on tv i've i think i've purchased this series at least two or three times in full um which is insane but uh i wanted to just talk about uh, each lethal weapon movie each episode about uh you know one of the uh the films obviously the first one here we're doing is uh lethal weapon uh not really one, but just Lethal Weapon. It came out in 1987. Um, and what I wanted to do is bring on a friend for each uh, episode. The first episode uh, here, I wanted to bring on my best good friend, um, Kevin Corcoran, who I've known for basic, I think almost as long as I've known my sister, which is insane because <laughs> my sister's 20. Um, but yeah, I met this guy, I, uh, I want to say Union Mill, fourth grade. Correct. Oh, yeah, somewhere in that area. Yeah, and uh, we really became friends in sixth grade. Yeah. But uh, basically what Kevin did is he really introduced me to um, horror films, him and our mutual friend, uh, Ryan Johnson. Uh, and really, I remember Scream came, Scream came out, and you guys were all about Scream. And I, I, my, my parents would not let me see horror movies. <laughs> They were not about that. I remember you, you get you and especially Ryan Johnson would always come up to me and go, "You seen Scream yet? Have you seen Scream yet? <laughs> hey, I hope your parents won't just see Scream." I didn't see Scream for years, like for, seriously. But um, we all kind of became we all kind of bonded um, just over movies. And one of the big movies uh, we bonded over, and I think it's probably because around the time we really became friends, Lethal Weapon Four was coming out. And so they were playing it on move, you know, TV. They were having deals. The different versions of the movies are coming out, and it was one of those where you know you're young, uh, you're forming friendships, you're forming bonds. And I feel like watching the friendships created in the Lethal Weapon series um, really kind of helped uh, accelerate that, you know, in some weird way. And uh, because the great thing about the Lethal Weapon movies in general is it's an action movie, sure, like that's it's fun. But what I think grabbed everybody associated with the movie and made it uh, enjoyable for everyone involved was it's really a story of uh, friendship, like when it comes down to it. You know, the buddy cop films that this inspired, um, they really go for, you know, kind of the humor and the action. But, you know, as much as like Tango and Cash and Bad Boys, all those movies are fun. This one just it focuses on this this the the family nature of it too you know cast the same actors in all four films you see the family uh you know grow up in front of your eyes you see the same house you see the boat you know get you know finally put on uh, some water time and it's just that and that that really and it's you know same same team behind it you know Richard Donner directs all four um, of course uh, Mel and Danny are in all four as well um and then you know you get introduced you know joe pesci you get introduced Rene russo and you get kind of this is you know by the end of the fourth one this really great family feel but we're here to talk about um the first lethal weapon film 1987 um and kind of talk about uh how we were introduced to it ourselves some of our favorite moments um you know the lethal weapon franchise is a franchise about like reoccurring gags as well um some of them show up late in later films but this one definitely has some as well and just uh, kind of wrap it up at the end, just talk about, you know, our favorite Lethal Weapon stuff in general and, you know, what that's inspired us to to like later on. So, Kevin, uh, let's kind of talk about uh, your earliest memories of the first Lethal Weapon. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's easy. I mean, I would go to my grandma's, actually, funny mm -hmm. enough, and she owned the original, like, three-pack on VHS. Oh, yeah. So I'd have, like, a week at my grandma's, and I would just marathon Lethal Weapon, yeah. all of the movies in one day. Yeah. And... So that was like always a special thing for me because I never owned them. So every time I go to my grandma's, it was just like by myself marathoning these weapon movies. Nice. And yeah, it was just an awesome time and love Mel. Can't yeah. go wrong. <laughs> and I think uh, I had a similar thing where I feel like it's funny because even though I'm doing a freaking podcast on Lethal Weapons series, I can't really remember like the first time I watched Lethal Weapon. But I can, uh, you know, like I said, in the around the, the fifth, sixth grade time frame, I can really remember either seeing it on TV and um, thinking like these movies were, uh, especially the first one, was, was hilarious. 
you know um it's not this like standard action film and so uh you know i remember you know talking about in class um and just kind of uh you know geeking out for lack of a better word um (laughs) over this uh this ridiculous buddy cop movie and it really you know inspired also uh i think um uh becoming a huge fan of like you were saying like mel gibson yeah as well it kind of i feel like it opened the doors for a lot of people uh <laughs> to becoming a big fan of mel gibson um because you know i saw the lethal weapon uh you know lethal the first lethal weapon before any of the mad max movies yeah um definitely before braveheart and any of the other kind of mel gibson maverick really. yeah maverick <laughs> well maverick has that great lethal weapon uh yep. nod in it with yep. danny glover they even play the saxophone the, yeah. and he's like <laughs> uh, yeah he's like no that wasn't no way and he, like, looks at, look at each other and it's a you know dick donner as well i think you even get a i'm getting too old for this shit as he runs away from the bank at yeah that moment. <laughs> yeah 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 which is classic um but let's kind of talk about the genesis the birth of lethal weapon which is funny because when i we were researching some of the uh the lethal weapon fun before this podcast (laughs) i found out that principal photography started um on august 6th 1986 now kevin do you want to explain to the lovely people why that's an important day it's a special day in everyone's lives but especially mine because it was the day that i was born and brought into this world so kevin (laughs) is brought into the world the day that lethal weapon starts filming <laughs> i mean i can't think of a more perfect person to have on the podcast yeah. than mr kevin corkin that's that's hilarious i that totally absolutely blew my mind but another great thing about this too is this movie really brought along the um the talent and the career of shane black mm-hmm. who uh basically you know was a ucla grad and wrote the script in 1985 um, they polished it a bit here and there, but basically the genesis and the characters and the, the raw script is what we see uh, in Lethal Weapon. Um, but basically, yeah, he comes out of school, writes his script, and immediately it gets picked up. Right. Um, now, it's not the immediate, you know, boom, okay, let's make a movie. But they saw, again, in the script, they saw this, uh, you know, uh, Richard Donner saw it, Mel Gibson saw it, Danny Glover saw it. Um, everyone associated saw that it was a movie about, uh, like, this this brotherhood between these two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and it sounds, you know, almost cliche now, but the idea of uh, this this white cop and this black cop becoming best friends uh, right. in, in the eighties too, like um, it was kind of this big deal. And the chemistry that Mel and Danny have throughout this movie, you know, in in the first movie, a scene that we always quote that, like, you know, if if you hang out with us for any amount of time, sometime we will say this, especially <laughs> if it's time for lunch or dinner. <laughs> yeah. The immortal scene where uh, Mel. And Danny or Riggs and Murtaugh uh, basically go into uh, this uh, after it's it's the jumper scene where the guy's about to jump and kill himself, which is the first scene that Mel Gibson ever directed. Um, and you know Mel gets him down in in, in very Riggs fashion <laughs> by Do you want to jump? Do, Do you want to die? That's fine with me. <laughs> and like you know they jump and the guy's you're fucking crazy, man. <laughs> and so you know Riggs and Murtaugh are like fresh new partners. Everyone thinks Riggs is trying to get the psycho pension or whatever. Um, Murtaugh is like, you know, I'm 50 years old. You know, it's I'm close to retirement, and this guy's gonna get me killed on the job. And he loses his shit, and they he gets get it, and they go and slam the, the door. Yeah, he slams the door that won't slam. It just like you know, it's like revolving or whatever, um, because like it's a construction site. And the great scene is where he's just like, "Do you want to die? You know, you know. Why don't you blow your head off a bullet?" He goes, "Oh no, I, I got a hollow point bullet. Get the job done, right?" You know, <laughs> which is a great. The hollow point bullet thing is great because that comes back as a great payoff in the end of the movie, yeah. where he gives it to him as a Christmas present, right? Because this is a Christmas movie, um, <laughs> after all. Yeah, after all, this is a Christmas <laughs> film, um, and maybe one of my favorites, if not my favorite Christmas film. Um, but yeah, and they have the famous thing where they, you know, uh, uh, Murtaugh is like, put the gun under his chin. He's like, you know, he's like, put it in his ear. He's like, yeah, yeah, why don't you shoot yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it goes through your ear. Why don't you put it yeah. under your under your chin? He goes, get yeah, the job done. Yeah, right. get, the, get the job done right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's put the gun in my head. And then, uh, you know, he sees the, the look in Mel's eyes that Mel is like willing to end his life because, you know, his wife has been has been killed and he's he's really depressed. And, you know, the, the immortal lines, you really are crazy. <laughs> uh, and he's like, I'm hungry. I'm going to get something to eat, <laughs> which for some reason, Kevin and I latched out of all the lines <laughs> in the first Teeth of Weapon. Kevin and I latched on to, I'm, I'm hungry, gonna get something to eat. I'm going to get something to eat. <laughs> From Lethal Weapon. And then he just turns around and walks out like, it's, around, oh, okay. And the great thing, too, in that scene, that we noticed because we watched it again yesterday just to familiarize ourselves even more, um, he eats right before that scene. He's eating the hot dog. 
Um, you know, hey, Rod, you want a hot dog? Oh, you know, this is such a, oh, it's so much fun, you know. <laughs> he's a hungry man. Yeah, he's a hungry man. You know, he just jumped off a building, to, you know, to, to, <laughs> to somehow save a guy's life. Um, but yeah, that's just one of those immortal scenes with the, uh, I'm hungry, I'm going to get something, something to eat. And the way he like, his face twitches when he's saying it, he's <laughs> freaking out. Um, also, some more fun from uh, just the first Lethal Weapon. Uh, talking about Riggs being suicidal in the film, that's something that really makes sets apart the first one from the rest in my opinion is the first and not to say that it's, it's two through four aren't serious there's definitely serious moments but one really focuses on the torment of Riggs, mm-hmm. um and i think that's something that really makes the the movie interesting because the original opening is Riggs in a bar I was drinking say, yeah. yeah and he's down a bottle of jack daniels <laughs> and this is on uh the lethal weapon four um uh dvd um, if you're interested, it, it has kind of a retrospective as well, and it has the original ending and the original um, uh, opening, and original end, which we'll talk about, but uh, as well. But the opening, yeah, he's basically just hammered. Doesn't even look like a cop, you right. know. Got the mullet, <laughs> down to think of Jack Daniels. The bar, the, the owner knows him by name. You know, he's like, you know, you got to get your life together, man. And he goes <laughs> to take a piss, and he comes back out, and these guys start, you know, picking a fight with him. Where these two guys, mm-hmm. and. Um, I'm pretty sure he said it. Maybe you could back me up with this. I don't know if I'm just hearing things because I'm a fan of Mel Gibson. But he's like, you need to talk to Jake. Jake says, I'm crazy. I'm fucking crazy. Yeah. And the guy's like, you know, fuck you, man. Tell, me not, tell you not to mess with me. Yeah, tell, yeah, <laughs> tell Jake. Jake says, not to, tell you not to mess with me. And then the guy's like, you know, fuck you. And they start fighting. And Mel takes the dudes out in like two seconds. And it's actually a fairly, a pretty gr- a great uh, choreographed action sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, you get some great head on stuff. But then they do like over the top. Because yeah. uh, it's a really crammed environment, it's not this open bar. Right. Um, it's and it's near like the bathroom, so it's like this kind of like wedged off area. And he just kicks the shit out of both of them, breaks the one dude's arm, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Yeah, you know, this is like better than going to the gym." <laughs> and the guy's like, "Riggs, you got to get or maybe because of Martin, I don't remember." But he's like, "You got to get out of here, man! Yeah, like, don't come back." Yeah, and he's like, "You can't come back." And he's like, "Well, let me pay for this uh, this handle of Jack." He's like, "Just take and get out." Yeah, and that's how the original movie was supposed to open. And while it was a great scene, um, you know, Richard Donner's thing was like, "Look, it's too dark." Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get to the dark stuff, right. but I think it. I think it was a smart. I mean, you know, okay, let let me uh, tell you how you should make your movie, Richard Donner. Right. But I think it was a smart move because um, it it it's it's such a dark, bleak, intense opening. Yeah. Um, where the opening we get us uh, in terms of meeting Riggs. I don't know. See, I don't know if that was supposed to be the beginning of the movie or the first time you meet or the Riggs. first time you meet Riggs because the beginning of the movie is of it's course, still dark. It's, it's yeah. still dark. You a know, girl jumping you know, off of a building. <laughs> yeah, jumping off a building uh, right after you know some Christmas tunes are jamming but yeah. like he, like she's like dead on the car she actually did that stunt in real life like I, the actress yeah, yeah. yeah um which is pretty cool yeah um, but uh she you know she's just dead on the car and it's like directed yeah. by richard Donner. <laughs> um but yeah but so that w- what we actually get um for all you lethal weapon fans out there you'll know this the the original rigs opening is you see a dog running to a trailer and you see a nude mel gibson stand up and you see his butt um that which Mel is ass. Mel ass, which is why Lethal Weapon One is probably my favorite Lethal Weapon. Film. <laughs> and um, you see him kind of like you know he's still not all there. You know he's drinking. You know he's drinking as soon as he wakes up, and right. he's just kind of you know not there in the head. And does um, he look at a picture of his wife at that point? I can't remember. I or does he just I, get up? And I think he just gets up and yeah. he's just kind of you know you know drinking. And he's like oh another day, another job. You know. Yeah. Um, but here's a funny thing: talking about like when we were younger, like watching the the Lethal Weapon movies. When I was a kid, uh, watching and and I the director's cut also has a scene where he picks up a prostitute and he uh, offers her money to come back to his house to watch Three Stooges. Yeah. When I was a kid, I thought that uh, the like ultimate, this is a weird segue because I'm not talking about the prostitute scene, but like (laughs) the scene where he's uh, just sitting in his house, like in his little like, you know, trailer on the beach with a dog watching Three Stooges. As a kid, I thought that was the life. Like I was like, if I can get there... (laughs) I made it. I made it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't got there yet. Um, I'm missing the dog and the trailer. But like, I, for some reason, when I was a kid, I was like, "That's the life, man." You just oh. you by yourself with a dog watching Three Stooges. I'd probably be watching Frasier, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but you know, regardless. Um, but you know, and, and, and speaking of the director's cut, um, there's also a scene where uh, Mel stops a, I guess it's a sniper, but it's a it's a guy at a school causing a ruckus and uh, a pretty violent ruckus and it's really shows and i think probably one of the reasons it got cut was like we've already show, like we've already been shown that mel's a loose cannon and a lethal you know a lethal weapon registers lethal weapon <laughs> um but 
he walks in kind of to this schoolyard and they're like, hey, watch out. He's like, oh. And he just like shoots the guy and does like, a, you know, a spin mm-hmm. 80s roll or whatever and saves the day while smoking a cigarette. <laughs> and I feel like it's a cool, fun scene. Like, check it out on YouTube or whatever. But mm-hmm. the thing that, you know, we already get that scene with the Christmas trees and the, you know, he thinks he's paying $100 for the thing of cocaine. <laughs> and the one guy's like, hey, man, hey. Hey, stop it. And he goes, hey, shut up, man. I'm counting. You know? <laughs> he's like, he's like 100,000, 100,000. He's like, oh, man, I can't pay 100,000. You know, what if I uh, take it off for free? And he puts the badge down. And the guy's like, this ain't a real badge. This ain't real. And he points, I don't know why he says this. He goes, you're not real either. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets the great Three Stooges thing, which Mel yeah. is a big fan of as well. You know, this is you know, was a, this is a real uh, it's a real badge. This is a real gun. Yeah, and I'm a real fucking uh, I'm, a, I'm a real cop. This is a real fucking gun. Um but you get the, you know, the shoot me, shoot me, yeah. come on, shoot me, um, which I think they reference in Expendables 3, but like, which he's in as well. But uh, yeah, you know, just it, it, so we get very much an early on, we get a clear sense Riggs is a loose cannon. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, sui- the su- scene where he thinks about taking his life with a hollow point bullet um, is what won him the role of Hamlet. Um, a couple years later, the director saw it and was like, look, I mean, that's a depressing fucking <laughs> play. Um, and we watched that actually yeah. in English class. Mr. Wood's English class. <laughs> and like, then proceeded to watch it at your house because we loved it so much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kevin, you want to watch uh, Hamlet with Mel Gibson? Dude, we just watched it. Yeah, I know, but I got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know what? You know, I'm biased towards Mel Gibson movies, but I, you know, I think he does a pretty decent job as Hamlet. Definitely. Um, his thing with that movie is he's like, the thing that's kind of a bummer for him is that that performance is forever cemented in celluloid where like the thing about playing Hamlet is every night you can change it up and mm-hmm. it's not set in stone. And he's kind of like, well, you know, the, the choice I make that the director uses, mm-hmm. that's the choice forever for like my version of Hamlet. Right. I was like, yeah, I guess, but you know, still a pretty good job. <laughs> but, um, and, and basically also another thing, crazy thing to think about, and we'll get to, to Murta, um, is that Mel Gibson by, uh, by the time we see him as Riggs, he's done playing Mad Max. Like, I mean, granted, it's 87, so maybe, oh, maybe they'll make another one, you know, because it was a hit, you know, people enjoy the movies. But, you know, now we know that, you know, he'll never be uh, Mad Max again in that sense because of the, you know, the Tom Hardy films and how, how well they did, mm-hmm. or t- Tom Hardy film. Hopefully there's, you know, many more, <laughs> as they're supposed to be. But, yeah, it's crazy to think, you know, by the time he's starting Lethal Weapon, he's already finished and wrapped on, some people would say, his most iconic character. Right. Which is kind of crazy to think. Yeah. Um, but so yes so we got rigs loose cannon <laughs> crazy cr- crazy crazy cop, crazy cop <laughs> you know um and then we meet the exact opposite in murtaugh oh. now his opening scene is a little weird <laughs> 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 because he's naked in a bathtub with no bubbles <laughs> and his he, entire family, here comes your family yeah, here comes your entire family he almost, he almost pulls <laughs> one of his kids in the bathtub with him like i'm 50 <laughs> <laughs> T- T- I'm, 50. <laughs> I'm 50 now um and also we were talking about we're like dude there's like he, obviously he's not 50 right but like man they make danny glover out to be old as shit because if that's by the case he's in his six he's in his 60s when lethal, the character wise right when lethal weapon 4 comes out yeah you know looking and good yeah he's looking good for Black it. I mean, don't crack yeah yeah he's he's he's, <laughs> he's, he's in shape of those movies still in in and four too when he runs out in the beginning you know Ray, you see, I did the thing. <laughs> the but um and 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 the Murtaugh character or Riggs character is supposed to be thirty eight, and I right. originally had misread that he was supposed to be thirty because Mel Gibson was thirty at the time. Right. And there's that scene where he's like, yeah, you know, back in uh, you know Saigon or uh, Shanghai, you know, Saigon, whatever, in Vietnam, uh, in in sixty nine, and I was like, hold up, sixty nine, he would have been like twelve. <laughs> But of course, he's supposed to be 38 because I'm an idiot when it comes to you know reading actual <laughs> trivia on IMDb. Um, so it all checks out. The fact checks. You know, Lethal Weapon didn't you know screw the pooch on. Thank that. you, Shane Black. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, though, we we meet Murtaugh, family man, fairly peaceful guy, yeah. um, has a nice thing going, nice house, the exact opposite of Riggs. Yeah. Kids, wife. Nice house, dresses nice. Although he's got a, an ugly spot on his tie, his wife's dropping eggs all over the place. Wife that can't cook. Yeah, yeah. That, I love that reoccurring <laughs> thing. You know, you're not gonna make me eat this roast by myself, Riggs. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you get you, know, you get this great setup of two characters that couldn't be more on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Right. You know, I, I get the feeling that Riggs is is fairly early on, uh, you know, in his career because he's a younger guy because he's 12 years. Uh, his you know Murtaugh's junior um, and you know Riggs 
is again I, I get the impression he's just kind of going around doing his thing you know like right. when the police force needs him he goes in and he fucks shit up that's the kind of rigs his thing and then rigs in yeah and, and that was the thing you know uh, uh shane black was talking about how great of a character is because i think a lot of people in uh you look at the lethal weapon films as kind of just like maybe you just throw away uh action films and of course, we're doing a podcast on the, on the Lethal Weapon movie, so you know we love them, and we take them, you know, seriously. But you know, the character of Riggs is like this really interesting, complex character, where he's got so many different um, the, the emotional spectrum that he can play with. You know, right? He he can go from being suicidal, he can go from being you know joking around and having a good time, and he can go from like every movie's got that moment where it's like this Popeye spinach moment where he gets hit, you know, something happens and he fucking goes crazy. Right. Right. Um. And in, and in, in the first Lethal Weapon film, I would say, you know, it's uh, him getting shot by Mr. Joshua of the shotgun, you know, the Mr. Joshua, Mr. Joshua. Um, which saved Gary Busey's career. Um, according to BC, according to BC. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were reading about, you know, this ha- this this is all before his accident, because like there's right. there's a very different Busey before and after. Yeah. You know, Um and you know he, he's you know what, what's the line uh, at the end? He's like, "What day is it?" He's like, "It's the day of Christmas." The day is Christmas. <laughs> and he like f- shoots the fucking TV. Um, but uh, uh, what were we talking about with freaking uh, freaking uh, Riggs? Riggs. Yeah. Having beat. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Zoning out of Mr. Joshua. <laughs> Those um, teeth. So yeah, he gets yeah <laughs> his teeth. <laughs> Supporting actor Gary Busey's teeth. Um, so anyway. Uh, Riggs gets shot with a shotgun. We're jumping all over the place, but we're hoping that if you're listening to this, you're not a first time. Like I've never seen Lethal Weapon before. <laughs> Go watch Lethal Weapon and then come back. Come right. back and listen to us drabble on randomly about m- random moments in the first I Lethal Weapon. I think it's film. very clear that we have a fetish for Mel Gibson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that South Park episode, <laughs> all timer. Um, I own that episode. Like they released like a, a DVD, The Passion of the Jew, where it's just I think it's just that episode. Yeah, and I own it because it's a classic. Um, but the, the, I love it that they like they rip on Mel, but like they keep bringing him back to be like, yeah, he's crazy, but the son of a bitch knows story structure, you know, the Imagination Land episode, right? Um, and he still looks exactly the same. Like they, those are just sound effects. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they've done like in the in the in the Imagination Land episode, like you know they've they've kind of through the years of South Park, they've upped their animation quality and like the look, and they've kind of got rid of the putting the actual face of the person on the thing, and they actually just draw the guy now. Right. But whenever they bring back Mel Gibson, they just put his actual face on the, like you know the half knit you know the the body with just the whitey tidies. You want to torture me? <laughs> <laughs> Give me back my money. <laughs> but uh, I knew we'd get to the South Park Mel Gibson in only a matter of time. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping we can reference that in every single episode. But uh, so anyway, Mr. Joshua shoots Riggs right, um, and he goes flying through uh, you know glass panel, and of course he's wearing bulletproof, and he's freaking out. And a line that I always loved, which I was going to name the podcast originally, was two inches lower and I'd be a falsetto for life. Because I was like, look, if we're going for a freaking podcast about Lethal Weapon, you can't, we can't name it, um, you know, we're too old for this shit. You know, we right. can't do the, the obvious, you know, a lethal podcast. We can't do any of that stuff. I was like, we have to pick, an, not an obscure, but like, a, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, actually an obscure line, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Anyway, that's where that comes from, and and he, you know, basically goes Super Saiyan uh, Gibson Riggs. Yeah, classic Riggs. Um, for all you Dragon Ball fans out there, that's about as far as my knowledge goes. That and Krillin, <laughs> um, and uh, and Riggs basically just starts running around the streets uh, uh, like a psychopath. Uh, I'm mad now, yeah. Rod. Oh, I'm mad now, Rod. Oh, oh God. Uh, well, actually, that comes later when he's running around, but uh, <laughs> he gets tortured. You know. <laughs> And I remember at one point when he's getting electrocuted, you're like, I think he's leaning into it. Yeah, <laughs> like, I think he, he kind of likes he me. Wants this. <laughs> Riggs <laughs> wants to be electrocuted. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he can break me. Yeah, eh? yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> My another another fam- f- favorite line of Riggs is, is when he uh, afterwards he gets electrocuted and he gets out and he saves the day. He's, oh! he's shooting everybody and he goes, "Who's next? Hey. Who's fucking next?" Well, uh, one other great part of that scene is when he is running out after getting tortured, and the guy just goes, "Hey!" and he just turns around and shoots. Oh him. yeah, like, yeah did that guy even have a gun? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Mel's yeah. just like, "You're dead now." Yeah, they're walking. They're walking through the uh, the club. Yeah, and everyone's like, ns, ns, ns. <laughs> and like, there's a, there's a moment, there's like a tick where all the uh, like, you know, it's 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 Murtaugh, it's Riggs, and his daughter, and they're all kind of like walking out, and they're all kind of like act natural, act natural, because yeah. like, you know, Murtaugh is covered in blood in like uh, a tank top, uh, you know, busted up, right. Uh, you know, uh, and and Riggs is 
wearing a jacket with a gun, like a gun slung over his shoulder with no shoes. N- no we shoes, don't, we, don't, we don't get the scene where he gets his shoes. That should have been the deleted scene where he yeah. steals the guy's Here's shoes. Here's some shoes for you, man. Yeah, here you go, Riggs. <laughs> I got some shoes for you, Riggs. Um, but he, uh, he, they, he, yeah, they walk up to the dance floor, like by the band, and he goes like, hey, what are you doing? And Mel hugs him and just unloads a clip just, in his yeah. chest and kills him and throws him. <laughs> and he's like, all right, we're ready now. And then they go outside and they just like, just, you know, he, he basically runs all over the place. Yeah. Uh, just unloading and going crazy, and he almost fights the tax. Was it a taxi cab guy? Who just some random guy who runs into. Yeah, him. he hits him and he gets I'm like a karate chop. Yeah, you. he's like, oh! <laughs> um, but uh, getting back to Murtaugh, let's yeah. talk about Murtaugh some. Good old Murtaugh, because he's got the beard, the horrible beard in the beginning, and he decides, you know, he's got to shave it, and that's where we get the sax for the first time. <laughs> yeah, and I was reading about the saxophone player. Like he, you know, he's not. He's one of those guys when you read about him, it's not like best known as the saxophone player who played the Lethal Weapon theme. It's like no, he worked with David Bowie, he worked with Bruce Springsteen, he worked with Elton John. I mean, extensive session musician, and his own work as well. So right. we got to give him props. Um, he knows how to play some sax. He knows how to play some saxophone. Also, I was, but I was like, why would he play saxophone with Springsteen on Born the Run when they have Clarence Clemens? Like, I don't right. know where that came from, but whatever, you know, according to. The uh, to, according to Wikipedia, he uh, I need more saxophone. Yeah, I, I need double saxophone. <laughs> Just dub it, Bruce. No, I need the I guy. Need who, I need the guy who hasn't done Lethal Weapon yet, who do, will do it in twelve years, <laughs> to do the saxophone on my masterpiece. Um, but Murtaugh is great because he. Is you know I guess he you could say he's kind of like the audience where he's just like you get strapped he gets strapped in with 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 rigs and goes on this wild ride. All One right. of my favorite scenes in the entire series is when they first meet in the police station mm-hmm. and they're like uh we're bringing on you're bringing on a new partner uh uh Raj and he's like oh yeah who and he's like some uh you know guy that everyone thinks he's crazy blah 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 and like they have that scene he's in while he's telling who the partner is he's watching who he thinks is like a homeless like you know criminal brought in right with like a nondescript hat which Mel loves because he brings it back for two a yeah. different hat uh floating ca- mullet yeah yeah the mullet kind of jeans you know whatever and he pulls out his gun to like check it and Raj is like got a gun and like <laughs> Best scene, uh, one of the best facial expression like moments in that in the series, is when he starts running towards Riggs, and Riggs looks at Murtaugh and he's looking around like, "Who? Who's got the gun? Got gun. Who's the bad guy?" Yeah. And then, what are you talking about? yeah, immediately takes down Murtaugh in like two seconds, and yeah. that's where the the immortal "I'm too old for this shit" comes from. Exactly. Yeah. I'm too old for this shit. Um, Speaking of great male facial expressions, mm-hmm. it also reminds me of later when Murtaugh goes to uh, visit his Vietnam buddy. Oh, yeah. Uh, Hunsaker. Yeah. And Hunsaker starts being like, you gotta kill him. You gotta yeah. kill him all. And Mel Gibson's just in the background like, Yeah, this is my first hell? day out with my new partner. Yeah. Th- that reminds me of the two times with him because like the first time they're in like the like the bank or wh- wherever they are, yeah. like the restaurant or whatever it is. And uh, bank or restaurant, same thing. <laughs> Both serve food, right? And uh, <laughs> he... Yeah, Mel's in the background just staring. Just like, what he's, like You're right. he's like, don't arrest him. Yeah. You fucking kill him. <laughs> you owe me, Raj. You fucking kill him, Raj. And he like grabs him and Mel's just standing at him like, you know yeah. what the hell? And then later on, when Huntsacker's killed, yeah. and in the background, we were joking like, how funny if like, Mel was doing a little jig in the back? Because like, he's <laughs> far away. Like, he's like, do, like, doing like... Just out in look, the, in, outside the window. Yeah, waiting for Mr. Joshua to come with a helicopter <laughs> and shoot Huntsacker through eggnog. You know, when he's got the egg, he's like... <laughs> He's like, heroin, you got off easy, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Murtaugh's always got this best like little one liners. Anyway, but yeah, in the background, like Riggs is kind of standing there, and at one moment Riggs is gone. Like yeah. it's like this quick cut, and we were hoping like, you know, it cuts back and Michael Myers is standing there, or like yeah. anybody else is standing there <laughs> in the background. And then, you know, Riggs does the thing. My dad always loves to point this out, uh, which is why well, I would say always when he's probably seen Little Weapon once. When Mr. Joshua kills Hansacker, uh, they run out and well, I don't know where Riggs was, taking a piss, maybe you know, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, doing something, and um, off to have a cigarette. Oh yeah, off to have a ciggy, and he sees the helicopter, sh- unloads a clip in a helicopter, and you see him take the clip out, puts another clip in, clip in. Helicopter is like gone, yeah, like it's on the horizon. You're not. It's on the way to Jurassic Park, dude. <laughs> like that thing is far away, and he unloads another clip, and my dad turns to me, he's like, uh, "Pistol will never reach that." at that length i'm like just oh thanks know. dad yeah thanks dad in you, case know, you're you know a lot of shit that's not going to be real is going to happen in this yeah. movie you should have been like you haven't seen him at the shooting range yeah yet, yeah so. have you seen him draw a smiley face on yeah. murtaugh's uh dummy that's another great uh facial expression mel and, and just a, a great scene between the two of them where you got an action movie they basically figure out what they think is that's thin that's real thin but you know they kind of stumble not stumble across because they're detectives but they kind of figure out the plot like they're mm-hmm. moving forward and a great thing about this, and, and, and credit to like Shane Black and stuff, 
and 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 Donner and everyone involved, especially Gibson and uh, Glover, they can take a break, whether at the shooting range, to have a pissing contest, right? Where they're like, pretty good, pretty good, and like you know, Riggs or Murtaugh has the 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 shooting. Uh, dummy, uh, you know, paper dummy thing. Go back, target. <laughs> For lack of a better <laughs> word, target. <laughs> paper know. dummy thing. What's that thing they shoot? Yeah, at? Yeah, the target. He goes, you know, a fair distance, a halfway. Right. And it, you know, he does the, you know, from the holster, boom, one shot right in the center of the head, boom, mm. kill. Right. And he's like, look at that, not too bad. And you know, and Riggs is like, okay. And he does that, you know, <laughs> and like staring at him, like raising the eyebrows, and does it all the way to the back. He pulls out his gun, doo, fire seven shots. And then we, you see the, you see the the paper target go all the way back, and you take the time for the paper target to come all <laughs> the way back, and we get the reveal that he drew, he shot a smiley face. Uh, you know, the the dead center shot is the nose now, yeah, and the two eyes and the smiley face. And he's like, have, have a nice, nice day. day. <laughs> I think a little Australian sneaks yeah, in. At yeah, yeah, he sneaks in the Australian a bit. I mean, it, it's funny because I think he does more in two. Like, uh, yeah. uh, I know uh, Chris from from Geek Out fame, and I recently rewatched two. For if him the first time, which is great to watch with a fresh pair of eyes, mm-hmm. um, and maybe we'll get him on here for one of the later ones as well. But uh, yeah, we, he was like, you know what? I think he's got the Australian accent more in two, and I think he does. I don't know what, what, if that was just a, you know, Mel just kind of had that, uh, you know, going, or there was more words that triggered that, you know, right. because um, for those who don't know, uh, you know, Mel was born in New York, but w- you know, moved to Australia when he was like twelve and kind of grew up there, like in, you know, for in really kind of. Uh, calls at his home in his, in his early childhood and stuff, and yeah. kind of developed this Australian accent. And the thing is, was it more of was he putting on more during the Mad Max film? Because it's it's in its bones that's an Australian film, you know, it, you know, same Australian cinema, and like you know, he's got that Australian accent. Remember, we saw uh, Mad Max in theaters. Yep. Um, uh, with your dad, we drove. I don't know where we went. It was. It seemed like it was it like was an hour. Or so it was out like, there, it's yeah. like the like the film institute, like their archives or whatever. Out. Yeah, it was. That was a really cool. Yeah. They were doing a double feature. Um, but we, we, we could only stay for, for, for Mad Max, which was fine just to see any Mad Max on the Definitely. screen. And I remember we, sh- we showed up to buy tickets and the guy was like, Hey man, we just have to warn you guys. This is a rated R movie. And like, we, you know, we were like, oh, like we were in, in college. Our, like, yeah, we were, yeah, we were in college Definitely. and like your dad was there. And like, yeah. I remember the guy, he saw I was wearing a David a Ziggy Stardust shirt. Yeah. He's like, dude, the guy's wearing a Ziggy Stardust shirt. I think he's seen some weird shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so, um, we went to go see. The first Mad Max. And it was great. They had trivia in the beginning. The guy was like really fun and stuff. And then um, we saw the American dubbed. Which we were both pretty let down about. Yeah, we were pretty bummed out. They did the American dubbing of Mad Max. And the reason reason why they dubbed it, which I thought was funny, was because they said American audiences had trouble listening to it because everything sounded like a question. And uh, I don't know if Mel did like his because it sounded like Mel Gibson, you know, like the right. American one. Uh, he didn't say either or. And I'm assuming I don't know if they because they did Road Warrior right at, right after they didn't do Thunderdome, <laughs> which you know obvious reasons. But like uh, I don't know if they did the dubbing for Road Warrior because Road Warrior was kind of its own you know thing. Yeah, they yeah. would have just had just Australian accents yeah. for that. But Mad Max because no one really knew about Mad Max, which is why it's really not known as Mad Max Two. It's known as Road Warrior because. Yeah. No one in America really knew what the hell and Mad Max was. To show that version when we went to see it, I thought it was silly. I was like, you, "We are here because we want to see." Yeah, the it's original. Like, it's it's cut not like of we're like, movie. you know, yeah, yeah, we're not going like, "Hey, um, prove to us Mad Max is awesome." Yeah, you know, yeah. like everyone there, it, you know, you don't drive an hour or so no, in exactly. traffic. Remember where that guy fell asleep in the, the middle wheel? of nowhere? Remember that guy fell asleep at the wheel and we saw, <laughs> like, we were, yeah. your dad was driving, and we were in like bumper to bumper traffic, and we see a guy. Fall asleep at the wheel mm-hmm. and hit the car in front of him. Yeah, and then I think he wakes up. Or the other car panics and hits another car, and cars are just jockeying back and yeah. forth. And your dad was like, "We're getting off here." <laughs> yeah. It was like gradual. Like he swerved and then like came back, and we're like, "Uh." Yeah. And he's like more swerving, and then he just starts like hitting, hitting. We're like, "We got to get out of here." This is Mad Max, freaking right here on the road, dude. Um. Anyway, back to lethal weapon. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, little tangent there. Um. So anyway, uh. I'm trying to think of uh, another kind of spot to hit on with Lethal Weapon. Oh, quick question for you. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have the answer to. Uh, I hope. Is this, this is before Predator? Uh, Predator, is this the same? Or sh- Predator was 86, I thought, right? I'm trying to like get Shane Black. Like, one, yeah, because I, th- I feel like Predator's 87. Yeah. Hang on, we're doing, we're doing research. This is Lethal Weapon podcast, not Predator podcast. <laughs> 87 okay so Just yeah in honor of shane yeah you know no yeah. yeah so 87 is is predator as well so okay good year for shane black yeah 
Really right good year. Shane. Yeah, and then Predator Two, which I always call call as Riggs Day Off, because um, the captain from Lethal Weapon is in Predator Two, as well as uh, Gary, Mr. Joshua. Yeah, Mr. Joshua, <laughs> who somehow survives. Yes. Um, because he dies in Lethal Weapon. It's his twin brother, uh, not Mr. Joshua. But yeah, the captain is not the captain in the movie. He dies as well. But like, uh, yeah, I was like, you know, it's, it feels very much like a lethal. He doesn't have the mustache though, Murtaugh. Yeah. Um, Richard Donner's brother, right? The captain. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the, yeah, so Shane Black, kind of 87 is kind of a good time because it's like the birth of Shane Black. Who's yeah, also awesome working on movies. a, yeah, he's working on a new Predator film, like directing it. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. And because he was basically put on Predator to be like, the watchdog to be like hey make sure this movie gets done and like no fuckery goes around here um <laughs> he's the guy with the glasses in the movie if you guys aren't aware um Puss is as big as a house yeah <laughs> why'd you say it twice <laughs> <laughs> but uh and then you know he one of my favorite movies he's ever done is kiss kiss bang bang which uh is kind of it's his 10 year anniversary this year it's actually the same day back to the future day is is the same day that um the uh, kiss kiss bang bang came out in theaters that was okay. the 10 year anniversary gotcha. if you haven't seen it see it it's freaking awesome it's um just this absolutely kind of hysterical very shane you know shane black's got a very um uh, very uh what's the word i'm looking for kind of a original unique style to his writing like you know it's a shane black script mm-hmm. so much so that he directed iron man 3 he called that movie uh, kiss kiss clang clang because it's like very similar you know and he works with robert downey jr like he's a guy mel's a guy too like you know we're all bringing it all together like mel's a guy who when <laughs> mel's a guy when <laughs> You know, Robert Downey Jr. was down on his luck and hitting some hard times, you right. know, with the problems he had in his past. Um, one of the guys to hire him and work him through shit was Mel. Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, so when, when, when Mel went through his, you know, heavy, his thing. Du- yeah, his <laughs> heavy duty shit. His rants. Yeah. Um, one of the guys there to, to have his back because he remembered what it was like to feel, you know, hated and ostracized was Robert Downey Jr. And Robert Downey Jr. is one of those guys now. He's like the, he's, he is like the biggest, highest grossing actor in the world now you know and the table you know the tables are kind of turned you know mel's not you know as big as he used to be and, right. and like i said made some mistakes and um but it's still working through it and you know it's kind of cool to see you know it, it's speaking lethal weapon and friendship and bonding stuff like the friendship's still there for mm-hmm. for for um for robert Downey jr to keep that um that friendship there to remember hey like i you know now that i the shoes on the foot like i remember what it was like to be down and out right uh, which i think is kind of cool that's really you know cool. um but yeah, and, and Shane Black really helped, whether he knew it or not, you know, launch Robert Downey Jr. into stardom because uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is really what helped get him uh, Iron Man, you know, um, seeing that star. I think Val Kilmer is hilarious in that movie as Gay Perry. Is Val Kilmer never not funny? Like, <laughs> yeah. what, everything he does is funny. You remember, do you ever, you saw MacGruber, right? I've seen bits and pieces. Okay. I have not he seen He is all fucking things. hilarious in that movie. There's a great scene where he's like, he's there, him, and, uh, him and this crony, he gives, uh, <laughs> Val Kilmer's the bad guy. He's look. He's looking at this nuclear bomb, and he goes, "Have you ever been to Washington D.C. before?" And his crony guy goes, "No, I've never actually been." He goes, "I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the missile." Just <laughs> 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 fucking insane. He goes, "I pretty oh, hard wow. in the movie. It's it's hilarious." Um, he's back on Twitter, by the way. I follow him. He's been gone for a while, and he just tweeted, "I'm back." <laughs> so there you go. Um, but kind of you know wrapping up Lethal Weapon because we've had some fun. But uh, any any kind of standout moments? Anything? Uh, Anything from the first... Would you call the first Lethal Weapon your favorite Lethal Weapon film? I think I would. I, yeah. To me, it's it's probably the best one going. I mean, yeah. they're all enjoyable. Even yeah. the fourth one, I'm probably yeah. in the minority on that. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the first, to me, is the best. Yeah. Uh, I think I think it, it, it touches everything that makes a Lethal Weapon movie great. Now, two, a lot of people um, consider the best, and it's a fantastic movie, too. I mean, you know, us by saying, you know, one is our favorite, or two, or three, or four, is... Um, no, no by saying hey that you know we don't like this movie anymore or whatever but uh i think one it it, it does it just kind of ticks everything perfectly on the, on the lethal weapon uh chart you know right. two is much more humorous and the thing that's that's great about two and and i'll get into that next week is is the you jump right into that movie like right. the, you know there, there's no you know they have to meet and they have to you know um form this friendship we'll kind of end it on this um lethal weapon ends on, you know, it's one of those movies when you, I don't know, like the first couple times I see, you don't really think about it, but this really great moment where Riggs basically acknowledges that Murtaugh saved his life. Right. Um, where, you know, Riggs 
does save Murtaugh's life a couple times, you know, by kicking ass in action and whatnot. But I think the more powerful emotional kind of moment is that when in, in the theatrical ending and the ending that we all know, and we'll talk about the uh, the original ending in a second, you know, Riggs is going over to Murtaugh's house. It's all fucked up, you know, because the car drives <laughs> through it, you know. Uh, sorry, no cops here, just uh, the good guys, you know. Oh, hey, bad guys, you know, love good guys or whatever. Um, leaving the note on the Christmas tree. But, yeah. Mr. Joshua was angry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're crazy. But you get this great moment where uh, Murt- uh, Murtaugh's, you know, daughter answers the door and, and Riggs is kind of beaten up a little bit. And he goes, you know, hey, give this to your dad as a present. He'll understand. And he gives her the hollow point bullet with a little ribbon on it. He's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be needing this anymore. Um, and you know it's it, we need really. I mean, again, we you know because it's a lethal weapon podcast, we want to get deep. We want to think you know below the surface about lethal weapon movies. But it really is like this like really great little powerful moment that almost goes unnoticed because it is just seen as a buddy action comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's basically acknowledging to to Murta, like, dude, you saved my life. Like, if it wasn't for you, I probably w- would have ended it. You know, right? Like, you've made me a better person mm-hmm. because of it. Um, you've given me a reason to live yeah yeah exactly and and you know and Murtaugh too like Murtaugh uh, learns to live a little <laughs> a little right. excitement you know um, you know and learns that he isn't too old for the shit like he's definitely not too old for the shit uh, you know in these movies because he kicks ass you know and you know and, and they both they bring out the best in each other yeah um, and so you get the great ending where you know they go in and they have a Christmas dinner and uh, and um, they complain about his wife's cooking uh, Murtaugh's wife's cooking and uh, I got a secret for you yeah I'm not crazy yeah I'm not crazy <laughs> Um, and then just to end this, the, the original ending for you guys who aren't aware means we would have never got any sequels, which would have been a bummer. This would have been a one episode podcast is, um, Riggs and Murtaugh are kind of like, you know, walking Mur- uh, Riggs gets in his, uh, his pickup truck and he's kind of like, uh, you know, Hey, thanks Roger. Thanks for you know, the kind of thing. Uh, he's a little more beat up. He's got like the arm in a sling. Right. Um, and maybe one or two other more cuts in his eye and stuff like that. And Murtaugh says, uh, I think I'm going to quit. And Riggs says, uh, don't do that, Raj. Uh, and they shake hands and he drives away. And that was, that was it. It was supposed to be uh, a one and done movie, um, about this friendship, but they realized making it with the chemistry and everything like, no, like this friendship is just getting started. You know, this is, right. we want to see more of this. And that's what happens when you get great casting, you get great writing, you get great directing, mm-hmm. great music. Eric Clapton played guitar for the, for the Riggs theme on this. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Michael came did the orchestration. Um, really famous. Uh, a lot of uh, my friends are no famous for like working with Metallica, like on S and M stuff, and uh, but also just massive, massive career with uh, with with uh, filming or sc- uh, scoring films. But um, so that's that's the original ending. But like I said, we get that great ending where where Riggs uh, acknowledges the importance of the friendship that they've they've created between Murtaugh and him. Uh, you know the twenty years of friendship we've had that yes. you can come on the the podcast and and have fun and thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I'm glad we could finally get you on, man. It's yeah. been awesome to talk about Lethal Weapon. Uh, next week, I'll have another friend, another guest on for Lethal Weapon Two. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening to uh, guys like us. Don't die on toilets. A Lethal Weapon retrospective. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>